See You Now is a podcast highlighting the innovative and human-centered solutions that nurses are coming up with to solve for today's most challenging healthcare problems. Created in collaboration with Johnson & Johnson and the American Nurses Association and hosted by nurse economist and health tech specialist, Shauna Butler. Racism, it's assault. Assaults on the human spirit. The data was telling us that different care was being offered to different patients. It's about an ideology of superiority. We are having to confront the reality that the media continues to be too white and too male. It's about moral suffering and physical harm. There are differences in outcomes depending on your skin color in the United States. And it's about systemic injustices and inequities. We couldn't issue statements anymore. That was not going to bring the change that needed to come. Part of the solution absolutely has to be collaboration across institutions to figure out how to be better at being anti-racist. We believe that as an industry leader, in working with others, we can help create a world where the color of your skin is not a determinant of the access to care, quality, or your own health outcomes. We just have a whole lot of work to do to help us advance where we need to be as nurses, as a profession, as humans living together with other humans. Welcome back to See You Now and part two of our episode, Reckoning with Racism. I'm Shauna Butler. And I'm Lucinda Canty. Shauna, that was a very interesting discussion with Cheryl Peterson from the ANA. I did love hearing about the work that they're doing to move forward, how they're looking more towards action. And I, I love that they have different ways that they're working towards not only just bringing awareness, but what do we do with our next steps? Yeah, I, I think one of the things that really impressed me, and I'm curious if you felt that, is it felt like a genuine um, expression of humility, a genuine expression of sorrow. You know, when there's that that request for forgiveness, it didn't feel like a corporate or an organizational statement, like we have to do this. What was the emotional experience that you had during that conversation? Yes, I, I feel like it's so important because the ANA, they're the leaders when it comes to nursing organizations. People want to hear what they say, how they feel. For me, it was important to hear that they're taking this seriously and that it's not a one and done and acknowledging that this is an ongoing process. Because I think yeah. people want a quick fix when it comes to racism, but they don't want that. And they're saying that there's several years of harm that we have been a part of. They recognize that it's going to take a lot of time. I don't want to say they can't correct it, but they can continue to move us forward. So as part of this episode, one of the things that we recognize is that racism exists across society. And so nurses are leading. We can be a huge part of the solution, but there are other parts of our society that play a really important role. So we're going to talk with um, an industry leader and we're also going to talk with a media leader. What are you looking for and listening for to hear from industry about their approach to addressing racism at a systemic level? Yeah, so I want to know how they're doing it, but I also want to know how they're even feeling as they're going through that process. And the, the other part is how do they feel like what they're doing has an impact? Like what have they seen? Because I know that we can talk about it. And I know sometimes there are things that are behind the scenes that they learn or they hear comments. I want to hear like what responses have they received from their work? And do they feel as effective? So we're also going to be talking with media. The media has a really important role about what stories get told, who tells the stories, what the headlines read like, how long they follow that. What are you interested to hear from media as far as their role in addressing racism and specifically how racism shows up in healthcare? Yes, and with media, I always do wonder how do they determine whose story is going to be told? And with racism, we're not supposed to talk about it. We're not supposed to talk about it out loud. So I want to know, like, how do they prepare? Why do they think it's important? And what are the responses that they receive from those who hear 
the stories that they report on. Exactly, Lucinda. So let's get to it. Up first, our conversation about the role the media plays in bringing awareness to racism and how it shows up in healthcare, why representation matters, and whose stories are being told. Hi, I'm Erin Haynes. I'm editor at large and one of the founding mothers of The 19th, which is a nonprofit independent newsroom focused on the intersection of politics, policy, power, leadership, culture. (laughs) The 19th is a newsroom that was started in 2020. And we were started because uh, so much of our journalism is leaving out people who have been previously unseen and unheard in our society and and does not accurately reflect the rising majority of of this country. We know that women, for example, are over half the population, over half the electorate, and yet we talk about women like a special interest group in journalism so many times, or as people that are only concerned with certain issues, even around healthcare. And we know that there are so many health issues impacting women, disproportionately impacting women of color, who we definitely work to bring in from the margins to center them in their experiences. Again, changing those perceptions around representation and reminding people that women are certainly overrepresented in a lot of professions, nursing certainly. And so being at the 19th, a newsroom that's named for the 19th Amendment, which guaranteed women, some women I should say, the right to vote, Black women Latinas, Asian women, and and Indigenous women had to fight much longer for their access to the franchise. But the idea that the 19th Amendment expanded the right to vote for more people in this country and that we continue to work in that spirit to do journalism that continues to empower and engage people civically, regardless of what their politics are, that seed was planted for me from a very young age. Well, I really appreciate the 19th News logo, that the 19th is named for the 19th Amendment, but there's yeah. an asterisk. And- well, thank you for calling out the asterisk because it, it is, it's again, in recognition of the omission of the women who did not get access to the franchise in 1920, that asterisk really is kind of a North Star for us. We're constantly thinking who is not being seen, who is not being heard, whose story is still not being told, and who are we not including You know, as we're telling this story, who do we need to bring into this conversation? This is an important and a sensitive topic. We're talking about racism in healthcare and specifically racism in nursing. I'm very mindful that racism in healthcare is not only driven by nurses, will not only be solved by nurses, that we have government policies in place, we have the industry, and we also have the media. And so, so much of what shapes people's impressions and understanding has been media, journalism, and media has its own history of racism. So in order to round out this story, we wanted to have a discussion with you about media and then a little bit more focused on how has racism in media impacted healthcare? Well, let's, let's do it. Let's, let's see where we go. So, So Aaron, What can you say about the history and the perspective of racism in media? I care about this issue a lot, so I I appreciate y'all including me. Media is an institution, and we know that the racial reckoning was really about a reckoning with our institutions in this country, and, and media was not excluded from that reckoning. We are having to confront The reality that the media for so long, and and in fact, uh, even into present day, continues to be too white and too male. So what does that mean for the perspectives? What does that mean for representation, both inside of those newsrooms, but also in terms of the decisions that are being made about who gets to be included in our society? Whether we are talking about on the big screen in Hollywood or in the shows that we watch, not not even getting into journalism, but so much of that media is about the depictions of certain folks. What comes to mind when we think about who certain types of people can even be law enforcement or first responders or teachers, you name it, who we are putting in those roles really can shape people's perceptions about those roles. 
So the media is certainly complicit and has been complicit in perpetuating stereotypes, but, but there's also an opportunity for the media to make different choices. And I think that that hopefully is what the ongoing reckoning is about. You were mentioning the way people are portrayed. One of the things I think is really important also with the media is they get to choose what stories are going to be told, who are going to be those expert sources, who are we going to turn to for expertise. When we put people in a role and give them a platform, we normalize what the expert looks like. Here's what the expert sounds like. It's not only who is depicted and how they are depicted, but what gets told. Yes. And who are the gatekeepers of those stories? Thank you for that. That's exactly, exactly right. And so when we're thinking about racism in media, how has racism in media impacted healthcare um, and the experience and the expectations that people have? Again, it comes down to that question of representation, that question of depiction, depiction of who gets to be a healthcare provider, but also what a patient looks like and how a patient is treated. What is that interaction between the provider? and the patient and how accurately are we reflecting people's experiences that can be very important, especially in terms of setting people's expectations. If someone is watching a show and and healthcare is the topic of that show or, or, or there's a scene about healthcare, that may inform what somebody expects to happen if they call 911, if they are in an ambulance, if they have to go to the emergency room, that their expectation may be set by something that they saw in a movie or on a television show. So it, it definitely matters, the kind of intersection between the media's lens on healthcare. How are you, the 19th News, intentionally addressing racism and racial disparities across all sectors, but specifically health? Like I mentioned, we started in 2020. We actually started three months before the pandemic. And I mention that because we know that the pandemic absolutely had intersectional threads in terms of race and gender, and also with the LGBTQ community that we needed to make sure that we highlighted. Those stories were not always being told by other outlets. And and because we have the lens that we had, we were able to take a different approach to a lot of our COVID coverage and really try to keep a focus on For example, what was the data gathering around race, around gender in terms of who was getting COVID, who was dying of COVID? What did the leadership look like around the folks who were responding to the COVID-19 crisis? What was the messaging that, that was going out to communities of color, to the LGBTQ community? They weren't even collecting data on LGBTQ folks. And that matters because they were invisible in a lot of ways in this pandemic, even though we know they were very much impacted by the pandemic. Um, But without that data collection, it's harder to quantify uh, things, even though we know them to be true. One of the things that I find so powerful about the 19th is your own hiring practices. Mm -hmm. Who's writing the stories, who the sources are. So I think from the standpoint of looking at where's that model, and becoming anti-racist in our media coverage, I think that that's just been a very powerful example of what can it look like? You know, when, when you think about how you're shaping public opinion, all of these things really matter. I appreciate you saying that too, because what I know, uh, having spent a couple of decades in this business before helping to start the 19th, is that diversity and, and representation, both inside and outside of the newsroom, that does not happen organically. (laughs) That does not happen by accident. You must be intentional about that. And that's whether we're talking about journalism or any profession, any industry. How can we be more intentional about creating the culture and creating the kind of approach to care that we want that is anti-racist? And so building a newsroom that, frankly, a lot of us wish we had had earlier in our careers and the newsroom that some of my younger colleagues uh, are expecting and demanding that happens on purpose. That happens because there are people in our organization that are thinking about this each and every day. And I'm so grateful because what we've been able to accomplish even in a few short years, one of the most diverse newsrooms in the country, and that shows that it can be done, but it also shows that it takes commitment to make that happen. Racism is harmful to everybody in in everything, but very specifically in healthcare. The data bears all of this out in terms of who gets care, 
delays in preventive treatment, um, outcomes for birth. There are any number of metrics that we can look at. We know that the harms are substantial and that they are very real. I'm very proud that nursing is being a leading voice in this. We're seeing our other clinical partners take a role in that. We also need our policies, you know, our government institutions, industry needs to take a part of this. There's a huge role that media has to play in. So what are some of the recommendations that you have for these institutional pillars to move toward being anti-racist in our practices and in our workplaces? As a journalist, my role is not necessarily to make recommendations about what any institution should or shouldn't do, but to ask what is the work that is being done? Three years out from this racial reckoning, you do have some institutions that are done reckoning, right? They would like to move on, move forward. They think they've reckoned enough. So certainly for us as journalists continuing to ask, what is the journey that nursing continues to be on to get to the goal of being anti-racist? Because anti-racism is not a goal that's going to be achieved after only a few years of reckoning, right? One or two solutions does not eradicate racism in this country, if only it were that easy. So for us continuing to ask the questions and also highlighting the people that are doing the work that is getting to that goal. So often we talk about, and not that we shouldn't, these things are important to talk about disparities, to talk about the things that that still need to be improved, but also highlighting areas of progress, I think is important to do. And so for us to look for those bright spots, report on those bright spots, report on what works, because somebody may read that and be able to use that as a best practice where they are. They may not have been aware of what somebody else was doing in another part of the country that they could also use. I hope that one of the lessons that we take from the pandemic is that we are all in this together, right? That we are connected and that none of this is happening in a vacuum in the, or in a silo. Part of the solution absolutely has to be collaboration across institutions to figure out how to be better at being anti-racist. Erin Haynes is a founding mother and editor-at-large for the 19th. And where Erin left off is exactly where we're going with our next conversation, which takes a look at what private sector industry leaders are doing within and outside of their organizations to address racial inequities. It's Vanessa Broadhurst. I'm the Executive Vice President of Global Corporate Affairs at Johnson & Johnson, and so proud that one of the things I get to do every day is lead the group that champions our race to health equity. Vanessa, What is our Race to Health Equity? What is that? Our Race to Health Equity is a program that we put in place a couple years ago, and it's a commitment of $100 million over five years where we're investing in and promoting health equity solutions because we believe that as an industry leader, in working with others, we can help create a world where the color of your skin is not a determinant of the access to care, quality, or your own health outcomes. We are thinking about racism in healthcare, the harms that it produces, you know, the multiple dimensions, the knock-on effects, the upstream, the downstream pieces that we need to be thinking about. And very specifically, as we think about achieving health equity, Mm -hmm. there are different groups that have a really important part to play because no one group in our society, no one sector can address this all on its own. Right. We're, we've all been a part of it. We've all experienced it in many different ways. And so the addressing it and improving it takes professions, health systems, industry players, government, media, academia, all of us. So you were up on Capitol Hill. Tell me why you were up on the Hill and what you were there for, what you were hearing. Um, I was up on Capitol Hill basically talking to members about our commitment with our race to health equity talking about, you know, some of the challenges that continue to face black and brown people in the United States in terms of their access to health care, in terms of the outcomes of their health care, and what we were doing as a company to lean in to help fix some of those elements. So you're talking to members. Mm -hmm. 
when you're having these conversations, is there's this recognition that racism hurts healthcare. It hurts healthcare workers, nurses, patients, systems, communities. Is that part of the discussion? I would say that there's an understanding that there is inequity in healthcare. When you start to use the word racism, I think different people have different views. But I think what people are clearly aligned on is that there are differences in outcomes depending on your skin color in the United States. And the question really is, what is causing that? And how can we, you know, be part of a holistic solution to change that? So when you talk about inequities, we're all really clear. And the last couple of years with multiple global public health crises, it's become glaring. It has. <laughs> just just how the disparities, the inequities, as it pertains to access, as it pertains to trust, education, insurance coverage, our sense of what we offer to different communities. And it's not just the access issue of like, this is available to everyone. Even when there's the same access, oftentimes in those encounters, the same, the same treatments or the same opportunities aren't offered to all people equitably or equally in that, Correct. In that instance. That's right. So when you're up there on Capitol Hill talking as a member of industry, specifically representing a healthcare life sciences company, why do you and why does J&J &J or any other industry leader, why do they think that they need to be there and why do they think that they can help? You stated up front that there were lots of roles to play in fixing this, right? But the healthcare mm -hmm. environment is also going to need the industry to help fix this because it's going to take all of us to see around corners, use data, get underneath what actually is the cause of some of these outcomes. So when we can provide data and get underneath what is actually happening, the wherewithal to get change to happen is to first start with education. And that's what we're trying to do. So when I'm up on the Hill talking to members, it's an education. It's keeping top of mind that this is an important and critical issue for Americans and it's also an issue that we care about and that we're willing to do something about, willing to be part of the solution. I want you to speak more to it's an issue and a topic we care about. We hear the stories and we have the data of where there is oftentimes an unconscious bias of offering patients different types of treatments, different types of clinical trials. There is this, I don't want to put that added stress of giving someone an option that maybe doesn't fit into their set of circumstances. All those well-meaning intentions oftentimes circumvent the ability for people to have a greater set of options and frequently ones that do work for them. Can I give you one example of this? Mm -hmm. We have a brilliant physician here at Johnson & Johnson named Dr. Avery Ince, and he's done some work on peripheral arterial disease and just pulling the data together on what happens between different races at different institutions in terms of amputation versus revascularization of the limbs? And that data is quite striking. So it goes back to what you just said. Are people being offered different solutions based on a preconceived notion of what they can financially afford, what they can tolerate from a rehabilitation standpoint, what type of post-care, and what type of quality of life they have? And I think that's where we get into this danger zone of having ininclusive behaviors, not offering all the options, and quite frankly, not offering the same quality of care based on inclusion biases. Can you share what that data was? And the Could. assessing peripheral artery disease? Essentially, when they looked at the institutions and they looked at the white populations versus the African-American populations, you saw significantly more amputations on a percentage basis in the African-American populations and significantly less in the white populations. It looked like the data was telling us that different care was being offered to different patients. And I believe Avery's even gone back to some of those institutions and had a conversation I, people mm -hmm. don't intend to have these type of outcomes, but there's something in the middle of it that we have to get to, and that is what's causing these, you know, inclusion biases. And we all have them, right? We all have them. It's getting underneath and sometimes using data to expose so we can have a different conversation around how we address and fix the issue. 
the data is really important for an awareness because oftentimes people are not aware that this is their practice or this is what's happening. And so that data is, is super, super important. When you, you were mentioning the program and the campaign of our race to health equity. Yeah. So this is a really bold, visionary, urgent campaign. I really love the framing of how our race to health equity is, is stated. It's a bold ambition that together we can create a world where the color of your skin is not a determinant of your access to care, quality of care, or health outcomes. There's also the statement that we're, we're turning a moment into a movement to rebuild healthcare from a diverse perspective by supporting solutions that systemically address racial health equity. So two things I want you to speak to when you say we're turning a moment into a movement. What was that moment? And how do you talk about and describe the movement and your invitation for others to join in? Yeah. The world's been through a lot in the last three to four years. And I think the moment really came both from the COVID pandemic and also from the murder of George Floyd and really looking at what we're doing as a healthcare company and asking ourselves, can we and should we be doing more? And that was the moment. But I can tell you, and I've been with Johnson & Johnson a long time, I've never seen anything catch fire like this because of the moment that our race to health equity caught and really caught fire. We have been working to make sure that we provide and help people provide competent care. But I think the reason that this is so meaningful is because of the moment that it was birthed, because of what was going on in the world, because the desire to do more was there at that point in time. The thing that really inspires me about the movement is that the roots are so deep. This has reached and touched all parts and aspect of what we do, whether that be diversity in clinical trials, whether that be some of the educational components and scholarships that we're providing, diversification of suppliers and really grassroots, making sure that people have the economic wherewithal and impact in jobs to ensure that they can afford care and pay for care. It has hit right to the root of many of the things that we do. And that's why I believe it's going to be a movement that is unstoppable over time. Our Race to Health Equity is a $100 million five-year commitment, but I think the impact of it will continue to generate and live on for, for decades to come. The piece that you're most in awe of is how deep the roots are. The moment that you're referring to, there was a deep reflection, you know, a, a soul searching amongst everyone and particularly our corporate leaders, but specifically in our healthcare settings. There was the sense of this moment can't not turn into a movement that has sustained impact. Yeah. And that impact really is how do we, I'm using Johnson & Johnson's word, help eradicate racial and social injustice as a public health threat by eliminating health inequities for people of color. That is bold. That is unusual. Is. That is making a very, very, very powerful statement. And then beyond the statement, there is the action. So as this has evolved into our race to health equity, and you talk about making a, an investment, being committed to the communities, you know, we always hear big, bold statements, campaigns, promises and you know, all those other things. How do you think that people in communities are going to experience and feel this level of commitment? So the action that you're taking, how does that translate into what I'm experiencing in my regular healthcare experiences, my regular healthcare encounters? I think there are a number of ways. The first way is we have to look internally and say, are we doing the right thing for our own employees? And that's where diversity and inclusion within Johnson & Johnson comes in. So we've made external commitments through our Health for Humanity report that we are going to specifically increase minorities at the M1 level to be 35% by 2025. And then we looked at Black Americans and we said we want to make sure that we have a 50% increase in manager and above level employees by 2025. And then 
I mentioned we also have a supplier diversity initiative. So that is making sure that our own house is in order. When you think about the impact to the community, we can't do this alone. We need partnerships. So it's forming enduring partnerships between Johnson & Johnson and other institutions that might know how to do some of these things better than we do. The internal piece is so important, getting your house in order, because we lead by example, and people will follow those who are walking their talk. So you also mentioned these external collaborations and external relationships. How are you using your race to health equity to impact workforces outside of J&J? So there are a couple of things. One is that we have partnership commitments with external organizations that help us to do this. One of them is national medical fellowships, where we have committed to scholarship funding to create more black and brown physicians because we know that culturally competent care is delivered more often when the physician and the recipient of the care uh, look similar. So that's important. We're also very committed around nursing. And Johnson & Johnson has had a, a longstanding commitment to nursing because we know that the front line of healthcare is nursing. And it's such an important component to providing culturally appropriate care. So we have had a commitment at J&J to nursing for over three centuries. And by three centuries, I mean we've spanned three centuries. And we have a commitment to nursing overall, but also through our race to health equity. So we have provided over $500,000 in scholarships for diverse nursing students through the foundation of the National Student Nurses Association. When you talk about investing in, in students, there are many parts of our healthcare workforce that need attention, that need support. And truly, it needs financial support. That's, that's a big piece of this. So starting on that front end with students, medical students, nursing students, That's a key piece to it. But then that next piece is, you know, you mentioned being on the front lines, but nurses are at all levels. How are you thinking about making sure that people of color advancing through that leadership track? How do we, you know, getting them as students is great, but we need to see them in the decision-making roles, the uh, policy-making roles. And if we're not preparing them for that, we're setting them up for not having success. So how are you thinking about supporting nurses in leadership roles? Yeah, that's that's a great question and so important. And we need to make sure that we support diversity in nursing for senior positions. And we have a partnership through CNO Academy to do that, really aiming to prepare diverse nurses for senior leadership positions. But we also want to make sure that we get nurses there, right? Mm-hmm. So, And then once you, once you get them there... What are you doing to make sure, do I feel welcome? Do I feel trusted? And do people appreciate my authority? How are you thinking about the belonging piece? We have a couple of partnerships there as well that are really important. We have our Steps into Leadership Program and Building a Culture of Belonging and Academic Nurses. And this is really to make sure that not only are we supporting skill development to help prepare to get into clinical practice. But we know that nurses are leaving in droves, too, and it's such a critical time. We know that, in fact, 50 percent of nurses leave their job within the first two years. So we're supporting a program with the National League for Nursing. And importantly, if we get people to this point, that's great. But I think it's also really important to continue to encourage diverse students to get into nursing. It is. It's the whole career progression. People have to see themselves as a nurse. It's not only people of color, but it's men. Um, so we, yes. need to, we need to reflect all of this. So people need to see themselves like that is a path for me. That is a place for me. That is a place where I can excel. But say more about yeah. why you think that nursing at all of these levels and advancing their careers is so important to address health equity. Nurses, oftentimes, not only the first ear to the patient, but also the first treatment provider. Their criticality to the system cannot be underestimated, and we know that many are leaving. So the other thing I was going to bring up is we need to spark people to get there, right? So Mm -hmm. we are also working to make sure that we share real stories through a video series 
of diverse nurses and nursing students to make sure that we're highlighting the career possibilities that are offered. You know, get people excited about the future of nursing. I would like to get them excited about the now of nursing. The now. Can you help me with yeah, that? okay, the now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, it's it, get them it excited their... now and keep yeah. folks developing in the profession yeah. and leaning in. Yeah. Such an important and thing. As you're thinking in that mindset as a corporate leader, and you've got a lot of experience in your career and, and interact with a lot of other corporate leaders who are leading other parts of industry. Why do you think corporations, corporate America, should be caring about racism in healthcare? Essentially, the world is, this is going to sound odd, but the world is literally a terrarium. We are all codependent on each other. Having bad outcomes for any given population does not help any population. It increases expense. It decreases people's life expectancy, which creates inequity in their ability to earn, which creates challenges for their families and not being able to potentially have affordability for certain things. This is one ecosystem. Mm -hmm. This is one ecosystem. And raising the bar on health for the population in general really helps everybody. I wanted to highlight that because I think it's really important for, as we're having these societal discussions, for each of us to understand it's not just a strategic corporate line item. It really is fundamentally important. It's the right thing to do, but it's also socio and economically the right thing to do. There are actual business reasons. It's in our reasons. enlightened self-interest. Yeah. It's in our enlightened self-interest. Exactly. It's yeah. not just about doing a good thing. It's about yeah. doing a thing that's good for all. Yeah. And it is about doing the right thing. I think that that's the... That's reason enough oftentimes is it's because it's the right thing to do, because it's the decent thing to do. Yeah, it is the decent thing to do. It's the right thing to do. Yeah. You know, you think about your leadership and J&J's leadership. How can you be an example to help other corporations, other businesses to use their global footprint, to use their reach, their trust, their eminence, their, their expertise to be key players and do the part that they're uniquely suited to do to mm-hmm. achieve health equity. You're having conversations that will influence others. How can you use those conversations to bring other industries yeah. into addressing inequities really at the systemic level? Yeah. So there are a couple of things. I think any industry can lean in on the focus of de and So we talked about inclusion, creating an inclusive environment, but also making sure that diversity is a part of it because creating a foundation of economic strength within all communities is really important. So that might in some companies look like supplier diversity. Make sure that we're increasing the diversity of our supplier base and really casting a wide birth in terms of who we bring in as suppliers. If you're a healthcare company, I think that is a sweet spot to starting to address health equity. We have a program that's called Research Includes Me, and that essentially is a campaign designed to create awareness and encourage black and brown people to take a look at a clinical trial. When you think about the devastating illnesses that the healthcare industry is trying to solve, a lot of times it is things like cancer or serious genetic diseases. If you've been suffering with a condition for a long time, a clinical trial sometimes is life-saving or life-enabling, right? Mm -hmm. For people not to take that option and get that type of care is potentially devastating. Also, importantly, to collect the data to make sure that as we're developing products, we're developing them for everybody, and we know how different products and medicines work in a variety of individuals. I think it's critically important, and I think everybody in the industry should and can lean in on that. We have mm-hmm. a lot of mistrust within the minority communities within the United States, and 
many times for good reason. We had Tuskegee, we've had other elements of, of mistrust between healthcare research and participants. But I would love to encourage everyone, whether it be in the healthcare space, in industry, as well as people in the community, to take a look, take a look yeah. and consider. Yeah, we, we all have a role in building health literacy, science literacy, trust in the institutions, trust in the researchers. Everybody has a role in that. When we think about this huge problem of health inequities that are driven by racism, there's a key, key, key role that nurses play in this. It is a key role, right? The whole entire ecosystem plays a role here. But I would say they're a key part of the solution mm -hmm. because they see, nurses see almost everything in the healthcare environment. Oh, yeah. We see yeah. it all. <laughs> they see, that's right. So there you go. We see more than most other people do, actually. That's right. That's absolutely yeah. right. Absolutely right. So if you think about, you know, they're really the hub to the spokes mm -hmm. uh, of the healthcare environment. If we can have nurses thriving, if we can ensure that nurses have the data around what maybe isn't going so well and the ability to look for and change those types of situations, uh, I think we can change a lot. I think we can change a lot. We have not crossed the finish line by any stretch of the imagination and with everything that's happened over the last several years, I think we, we've lost potentially some ground. The world got complicated with COVID but what an opportunity for the future we have. A sincere thanks to our episode guest, Vanessa Broadhurst, Executive Vice President of Global Corporate Affairs at Johnson & Johnson, journalist Erin Haynes, a founding mother and editor-at-large for the 19th, and nurse Cheryl Peterson, Vice President of Nursing Programs at the American Nurses Association. Racism in America remains pervasive, and it shows up in surprising, dehumanizing, and deadly ways. It's led to sicker, shorter lives for people of color, as well as a healthcare workforce that hasn't reflected the communities it cares for. And racism has harmed, and continues to harm, nursing, and particularly nurses of color. The American Nurses Association is on a journey reckoning with racism in nursing, a long, committed journey along with many partners inside and outside of nursing and healthcare. A journey that requires, as we've heard from our episode guests, looking internally, making certain one's own house is in order, making a long-term commitment to action, listening and reckoning, being in it for the long haul, and how vital, valuable and powerful nurses are for addressing racism within and beyond nursing and healthcare. And in seeking out and working with partners in this challenging, often unsettling, and difficult work. And speaking of partners, I want to thank you, Lucinda, for joining me as a co-host for this episode. Thank you, Shauna, for inviting me. I care about this issue and appreciate that we, in some ways, represented how we can have conversations on racism. And as we wrap this, Lucinda, I wanted to capture your thoughts on why is racism such an important issue for nurses to confront. Because as nurses, when we hear things, we're not supposed to run. We're supposed to try to understand and try to see where we're involved in why things are happening or why things are the way they are. There are people who are afraid to talk about racism. And so they run when they hear that. But as nurses, we need to stay. And, you know, we're human. We do get afraid. You know, there are things that are scary that we don't understand that are disturbing. And so we do run from those things oftentimes. What do you think is, for somebody who might be feeling intimidated or afraid or fearful of a conversation in racism, what would be your guidance to help them lower that fear or to, you know, the phrase I use oftentimes is, we just need to get a little braver. <laughs> so how do you help people to... um like overcome some of that fear so that they don't run away and that they, you know, that they can stay here and be a witness and to be a part of the progress and the healing. Yes. And I think that's the important piece of addressing racism. It's not comfortable for anyone and it's okay to be uncomfortable. It's okay to be afraid. 
I always feel, I want you to feel something. So I'd rather you feel that than to not feel anything at all, because then you're not going to be moved to action. But if you're afraid, if you're nervous, if you're uncomfortable, then that means that there's something that you can reevaluate within yourself, but to know that that's okay. When it comes to racism and addressing racism, we're all in different areas of this journey. We're not all at the same level. And I met nurses who have been in nursing for over 40 years and never had to talk about race before. So now it's being like almost thrown in their face. So I can understand that discomfort. But I think again, it's a time to reflect and say, why am I uncomfortable? What does all of this mean to me? And what can I do? For See You Now, I'm Lucinda Canty. And I'm Shauna Butler. Thanks for listening. Nurses are transforming healthcare through innovation, compassion, and leadership. And Johnson & Johnson is proud to continue its 125-year commitment to champion nurses through recognition, skill building, leadership development, and more. The American Nurses Association is dedicated to building a culture of innovation. Nurses improve the lives of patients and communities through innovative thinking, empathetic connection, scientific rigor, and sheer determination. ANA is proud to support and advocate for our nation's most valuable healthcare resource, our nurses. For more information on See You Now and to listen to any of the earlier episodes in our library, visit seeyounowpodcast.com.